Wonderful. So we've got the seating arranged. It's like musical chairs up here. Um, our master class now is uh, very exciting. It's got a topic um, that is of utmost importance, I believe, for the energy transition that we're all trying to master. The title of the master class is Exploring Current and Future Technologies for Stationary Energy Storage. A big and important topic, and I'm very glad that we have three masters of the field here on stage. After all, the topic is a master class. Um, to my far right, uh, we have uh, Uwe Ahrens. He's the managing director of Altec Advanced Materials. Um, in the middle of the three, we have Michael Peiter, who is the chief technology officer of Volt Storage. And right next to me, I'd like to welcome Manuel Laubletner. He's the business development lead at Rymac Energy. Very glad to have you all on stage. The way we're going to do this is we're going to have three brief presentations by our experts. Um, and after that, we would like to engage in a discussion. As always, the discussion is supposed to be as interactive as possible. So please keep up um, your participation by sending in questions and doing the voting through the app. So with that being said, I'd like to hand over and we'll begin with Manuel, who will give us the first presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to start this presentation uh, with a number. The number is 275. When was the last time that you woke up in the morning and you said, today is the day. Today, I want to sit in a car. I want to drive with 275 kilometers an hour. Reverse, obviously, right, to make it a bit more interesting. And this has been done very recently as one of the latest uh, world records with uh, this car here, the Rimac Nevera. You see here a couple of additional numbers. All of those are world records that have been uh, done very recently, a lot of them at the Nürburgring. And usually if people know about Rimac, the brand uh, Rimac or the Rimac group, it's related to this car. The founder of the company, Mate, Mate Rimac, uh, and we are headquartered in, in Croatia, so maybe not one of the automotive hotspots until now, uh, at the very early days was participating in, you know, road races. At that time, he used a combustion engine car, uh, and at one point, that car broke down, and he decided to convert it into an electric vehicle. That was around 15 years ago. And he did that conversion in such a successful way that he was winning races afterwards. He got a lot of traction, a lot of interest, a lot of interest from investors also to form a company around that and to bring that product actually to market. And that was the starting point uh, of uh, Rimac. Today, Rimac is a company with 2,000 employees. Uh, more than half of those are engineers, so we are a very engineering-driven, innovation-driven company. Uh, we are headquartered in Zagreb. This is also where we have our uh, production. Very recently, uh, we, we finalized the, the latest production facility, a 200 million euro investment. The funny thing about that one is, before it was finished, it, it was already too small again. So we are thinking already about the next uh, manufacturing facilities there. And what we are doing there is the following. So there are two main parts of the businesses. On the one hand side, there's the hypercar side of the business, that's the Bugatti brand and the Rimac brand. Those vehicles are uh, designed, manufactured, tested, validated uh, within that business unit. It's a low volume but high margin business. And on the other hand, there is Rimac technology. And within Rimac technology, we are offering the innovations and the, the technologies that came out of that development, especially of the, of the Rimac car. And you need to imagine at that time, Mate didn't have, you know, a lot of cash available to go to Bosch or Conti or whoever you name them and ask, you know, develop a, a powertrain system based on those requirements. They developed everything in-house. And based on that massive amount of, of knowledge that exists there, uh, we have world-class engineers when it comes to how are you designing great battery packs, great modules, great power conversion systems, how are you integrate that in, in, a, in a really great manner. And those products are offered to, to other, uh, supply, uh, other OEMs. So it's a tier one uh, supply business at the end of the day, with the main product being uh, high performance battery packs. 
Within that Remats technology, very recently we founded also uh, Remats Energy. So Remats Energy is now the, the energy storage part uh, of the business. And why did we do that move? Basically, the know-how was there to develop a great product vertically, uh, which is already a bit rare in, in that stationary storage uh, overall business. And uh, we had a really, really exciting innovation that we decided to bring on the stationary side at first to the market. And this will, will also be a part of, of this presentation here today. So this year we introduced uh, the brand Remats Energy. We uh, uh, introduced our first product, which is the, the Remats Energy Science Stack. And uh, we took all of that knowledge, how, you know, how to design those battery modules, how to consider the fire protection uh, uh, in, a, in a great manner, how to, to integrate uh, a power conversion system. And we added this piece of innovation on top of that, which, which differentiates us from pretty much everyone else out there. On the left-hand side, uh, you can see how conventional stationary storage systems are working, and I'm talking here about lithium-ion-based systems. You have uh, a, DC, a DC block, maybe a 20-foot container, and uh, you have all those battery modules in a series, and then you connect it to a central inverter. And you, you're creating the AC um, waveform by chopping this DC voltage into small pieces based on a PWM signal. And there's nothing wrong with that technology. It works. It has been done many times. It's today's more or less state of, state of the art. But you can do actually much better. What we are doing here is we are, from a topology perspective, we are using a so-called modular multi-level inverter approach, which means instead of having battery modules fixed connected in a series, we electrically switch the modules in and out, in series, in parallel, to create the sinus wave. And that gives us a massive, uh, massive advantage. It pushes the, the efficiency of the system. It pushes the, the way how you granularly granularly control the system. Typically, the weakest cell in one of those chains on the left-hand side defines your end of life. And it could be that over the lifetime, over 10, 15 years, those battery modules are, you know, developing in different ways. They have different state of health statuses. And with that piece of technology that we have there, we can find those modules that drifted away and, you know, increase the duty cycle for those who degraded less, and by that doing so, we can achieve a more or less even end of life over those battery modules, which has a huge impact on the levelized cost of storage, which, which is one of the main drivers of, of battery storage systems. Um, I summarized a couple of those advantages on, on this slide here. So if you really want to break it down, what are the advantages? I see my colleague stands already up, so I'm done in 30 seconds. Um, you, you can increase the efficiency of the system. You can increase the amount of energy that you're extracting from the system. Uh, you can decrease the footprint of the system. You can decrease the noise of the system, which is very often one of the key requirements. You wouldn't think about that. And this is what we are bringing to the market and the piece of innovation. And yeah, handing over to my colleagues now. Thank you. Manuel, thank you so much um, for this uh, exciting uh, presentation um, on Rimats. And uh, I would like to hand it right over to the next presenter. We'll have the discussion afterwards. Next, I'd like to ask uh, Michael um, to um, present to us and uh, show your slides, please. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael. I'm one of the founders of Vault Storage. And we want to change how we perceive and use renewable energies in the future. Because the big problem that remains is base load power from, renew bleh, from, from renewables, very hard to speak out, but it's basically I'm providing a constant load of power over every second of every minute of every hour in a year. And that is very hard to achieve with um, renewable energies today because they're intermittent, like solar and wind, which is mostly used. And I, I, I don't think I have to explain to you why we need batteries for that. But let's go into one example. Here in Germany, if we combine wind and solar, we can only reach a base load availability of a bit more than 50%, meaning 50% of the times we can push that base load power into the grid, 50% of the time we don't have that base load power available from renewables. I mean, it's not terrible, but it's not great either. 
And with batteries, you can extend that um, to, well, today, most likely 70 to 80% with existing technologies. But what would be great if we would reach 95% plus of baseload availability. And 95% plus is something you reach with uh, fossil fire power plants, like coal fire power plants or gas fire power plants. So what you need for that is something called long duration energy storage. What does long duration energy storage mean? So basically it means that charge and discharge durations are quite long, usually 8, 10, 12, 24, even 48 hours of duration because you need to bridge the gap of wind power and solar power that exists here in, for example, Central Europe, which we have a very nice name for it in Germany. It's called the Dunkelflaute, but that's a different story. And with that 95%, we would hit it. Um, but there's a big problem. We don't have the technologies yet ready for this task. And this is why we set out and developed the iron salt battery technology. It's a proprietary technology based on a redox flow battery technology. What it is in a redox flow battery technology, if you don't know, I don't want to bore you, but it's fundamentally different to any other batteries we have here today in our smartphones or laptops. It's based on having two fluids that have ions in there where you can store the electricity chemically and then pump it through one or multiple cells to release that energy or store it. And the cool thing about this technology is that you can scale power and capacity independently. And the ratio between capacity and power is the duration. So what you can do is very long durations and uh, durations of 12 to 100 hours is our sweet spot for this technology. It runs from minus 20 up to 50 degrees Celsius without needing anything like to cool or heat it up. You can charge and discharge a battery over 10,000 times without losing capacity. But the best thing about this is it's abundant materials only. As the name suggests, iron salt. Um, this is um, like 95% of the electrolyte contains iron, salt, and water. And uh, you can pretty much get that everywhere. And oh yes, we have patented that solution. So we are proud that we are on this duration window with this technology are the only ones in the work, world working on it. And why do we need this battery technology? To have the lowest cost. Because that is actually the, the number one criteria which kind of hinders the integration of more batteries into the grid, um, more renewables into the grid to reach that 95% or at 100% in some countries um, at some point um, to get to base load power availability. And if we look at it, there is existing technologies for long duration energy storage, gravitational energy storage, lithium ion batteries, zinc air batteries, compressed air energy storage, power to gas to power, which is basically hydrogen or thermal energy storage. But our technology has the lowest cost of electricity to store, um, has the lowest capex cost, and has a higher efficiency than most of these technology mentioned on the slide. And we provide this battery technology to reach as low as 25 euros per kilowatt hour on a DC level. So where do we stand now? It would be great if we would have that on the market yet, but you cannot buy it, unfortunately. So um, me and our team of 80 people um, based in Munich, Germany, we are developing this, this technology for a little over five years now. And uh, we're proud that we can produce first tester modules and next year we're in the prototyping phase of scaling it up to the size that we envision as a product sizing and to build very large energy storage, uh, storage solutions with our partners which are mostly utilities, grid scale operators, etc. And um, I'm happy to take your questions uh, later on. Please approach me in the hallways if we see each other. Thank you very much for your attention. Michael, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very interesting presentation, and I'll hand it right over to you, Uwe. You're next. Your presentation, please. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are at the Future Battery Conference. In my case, that is the grid storage battery. And the main question that I pose to you, I mean, why are we all here? Uh, why are we doing this market? And the answer is we really need these batteries. There is no energy transition in Europe or anywhere else without a battery. There is no fast charge augmented with battery. There is no grid stability. There is nothing there. There are two things we have to overcome. One is the renewable energy is being produced when it is not required. So we are bridging this gap. The second is many times the energy is being produced 
and cannot be delivered where it's needed. We all know energy produced for windmills in the North Sea cannot be delivered to Munich. And what does the result into? There's a wonderful agency in Germany, we have an agency for everything, called Bundesnetzagentur, they're recording the energy that is thrown away. You can download it in 21, it was 2.3 billion euro. In 22, 4.3 billion euro, and that is increasing. That is a lot of money, so we need those batteries. Now we know there is a need. Is there money to be made? And yes, it is a huge market. If you look at any arbitration, arbitrage or trading of energy, it's from negative to positive. Sometimes it can be multiple 10 cents. So you and I had a big area, a good battery, we'd be all making good money. So that is the way how it goes. And if you have levelized cost of storage below 10 cents, you can calculate. This is all making good money, and that's why everybody says there is a fast-growing market. Ellen Musk says the stationary battery market is bigger than the car battery market. And you can see here, everybody goes around 30% uh, annual growth, and the total market value is 620 billion until 2040. Now, when we talk about batteries, we all lithium-ion batteries is the way to go at the moment, but there are challenges. And the challenges are much more than safety, fire and explosion. It's raw materials. Everybody is fighting for raw materials. Europe has no lithium, all these other things. Then, lithium-ion batteries are sensitive. They need to be cooled, they need to be heated, they need to be tracted, they have to. And it's not environmentally friendly. Cobalt still comes from the Congo, and I go on and on. And you need to operate them. You have safety teams, you have all these things. But the main thing is, in seven years, they don't have the same power. They're degrading. All my colleagues, they have solutions. Storder just said there is something, but the fact is they're degrading. Same like your handphone. You buy it, two years later, there's nothing. So now there is a solution. There is a solid state sodium battery that we are producing. It uses only salt, ceramics, and nickel. It doesn't use lithium. It doesn't have cobalt. It doesn't have graphite. It does have copper because it builds the anode itself. It can do three cycles a day. It's abundantly thin, and it lives in 10 years. The battery has the same cycle. It's plug and play. You can pick up the battery. There's nothing inside that burns. There's nothing. You can fully charge, put it in the basement of the shopping mall, and go on. There's nothing there. And because it is not hazardous, you can transport it. You can put it on a ship, you can put it on a train, in a container, one mega pack, and move on. So that is a fantastic solution. It sounds too good to be true. No, it's true. It's a battery chemistry that is available. You can come, you can look at it. The prototypes are there, ready to pick it up. We have the C rates, we have everything there. It is the lowest levelized cost of storage that you can have, and that is what we have to offer, and that's what we think is the future of grid storage for the applications. But let me be clear, the market is huge, and there is a solution for every battery. There will be iron battery, there will be other batteries, there will even be redox flow. There will still be water storage, but for the application, safe, augmented, fast charge in the grid, you can decide. You want to have a lithium-ion battery that may catch fire, or you want to have a solid-state battery. Thank you very much. Uwe, thank you very much. Uh, yet another very impressive presentation on yet another technological uh, approach. Um, I would like to start with a round of questions now, and I'd like to start with you, Manuel. Um, you made it very clear in your presentation that you are using quote-unquote normal lithium-ion um, type batteries. But what, what is it that differentiates um, your technology from others? Um, and maybe we can also tie in one of the questions already from the audience that goes in the same direction. What maybe in more detail is the chemistry that you're using in, in, uh, in, um, in the stationary storage of your company? Yeah. So... We are using, to answer that right away, at the moment at least, uh, LFP battery cells. Uh, those are from the lithium ion uh, basically pool that you can select at the moment, just the, the best cost performance uh, chemistry that, that you can get. Um, but we are pretty much 
agnostic there. So if in two, three, four years we will have sodium ion cells, we, we are also able to integrate those. So we, we, we are not a battery cell manufacturer. We, we choose those battery cells at the moment, the LFP, either 280 amp hour, 306. Some suppliers offer pre-lithiated uh, battery cells, which is also really interesting to push the, the lifetime even further. But where we differentiate really is on the power conversion system. How are we using those, those battery cells? And we see so far, um, also based on our competitor analysis, there are not that many battery, stor battery storage products out there from a supplier who really vertically understand every piece of equipment that goes in there. Um, Tesla would, only, would be a great example. They do that, and they're doing that super successfully. A lot of the Chinese players who have fantastic products, but very often it's like a DC block. Sometimes it's a DC block with uh, inverters from someone else. But doing really the development of every piece of component gives you such an advantage of really understanding what's going on in that system, also in terms of which data uh, do you have access to. And we, we put a, a, on top of that a layer of advanced battery analytics because we have access to all that data. And this gives us, uh, uh, yeah, brings us into position to offer a really, really strong product. Thank you, um, Manuel. Um, we have um, another question here from the participants, um, and that is uh, obviously directed towards you, uh, Michael. Um, what is the charging cycle efficiency of the iron salt flow battery? I think that question is related to the um, energy efficiency uh, of the DC system, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is between 70 and 75 percent. This is the target level we set out for a product. Um, so this is in line with roughly what you can expect from um, pump storage hydro. Um, it's less than lithium ion batteries. Yes, we know that. But it's considerably higher than any other long duration energy storage technology, such as gravitational energy storage technologies, power to gas to power, compressed air, um, uh, new ones like the iron air battery, um, which is currently promoted by Form Energy in the US, um, and thermal, especially thermal and hydrogen have an efficiency of around 35% electrical round trip. So we have double the efficiency of that, which also means lowering the cost for um, per cycle, so levelized cost of storage by quite a bit. Can we jump right into the next question? Of course, jump right in. So the next question is about redox flows, batteries. Biggest problem is the stack lifetime and how long is the stack working and how you fight this weakness. So this normally refers to um, other technologies in redox flow um, chemistries, such as vanadium redox flow chemistries, uh, zinc bromine redox flow um, technologies because the acidity of that medium is, or the pH of the medium is quite low, so the acidity is very high, meaning the materials to be used um, are a bit problematic, as well as the separator or membrane in between. So for our iron salt battery, we operate it in, in uh, pH levels of up to 3.5, which is the Diet Coke you can't get out of the fridge. So this is the acidity level we're talking about. Um, and that's why we can use cheaper materials, but also materials that last a lot longer. So the materials we use has been uh, tested for decades now in lead-acid batteries. And um, that is kind of the weak link, or that was the weak link of uh, redox low batteries. And this is what we counteract. And others like the, the gaskets, etc. We also have, for example, a patent on uh, gasketless stacks so that we encapsulated um, in a uh, two-component um, polymer, basically, um, and that is uh, something we pursue as well. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, Uwe, I have, uh, the question I'd like to address to you is, um, I mean, you made it very clear in your presentation that there's room and space for all different types of technologies in this highly growing market. Um, but um, one of the participants here is asking, with a lot of um, likes, um, how will you deal with the future situation even after 2030 um, in the market that your new batteries will have to compete with used EV batteries? Um, what's, your, what's your position on that? Will that lead to a different um, assessment of the market potential? Yeah, my, our opinion about secondary market batteries being used is very clear. 
the battery materials are expensive that are inside, and the battery, as you know, is deteriorating. Deteriorating doesn't only mean that there is no energy really at that, that level, maybe at 60%, but the danger increases much. As tired battery has more chances of catching fire and having. So I think it will be counterproductive. There will not be an application in 2030 and thereafter for aftermarket use of batteries. What will happen is the car companies will take back their batteries, recycle it, use the materials. It's worth more than secondary life. That is clearly what I hear and what we feel and that what is the market. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, I just like to catch up because Michael sure. is talking about Rideau Slow and, and uh, efficiency. Um, I, I'd like to state, I mean, like a solid state battery has efficiency always over 90%, ours including, because there is no aircon, there is no temperature management, there is no heating in the winter because it's self sustained. And uh, uh, it is really uh, the way to go. And um, as I said, yes, there will be other applications on long-term storage. Um, and, and each one has pros and cons. And uh, I think for the, the, the redox flow is a good long-term solution if you have a lot of space. Mm -hmm. Manuel, I saw that you wanted to comment on this particular topic. Yeah, uh, with regards to that question about the second life applications, um, until 2030, I think we and I have uh, a similar opinion than what, what you said. The, the question that I always ask myself there is, if I use a, a, a second life battery that was designed, or let's say that was manufactured 10 years before the second life application, and that was designed 15 years before that, how should that battery be able to compete with a brand new battery cell based on later technology uh, and the costs are going down there as well. So wouldn't it be much better to recycle that battery cell and build new ones who are then just significantly better? I mean, that will go on as long as the, the innovation, like speed of, of those batteries is that high. Once that flattens a bit, that might be the, the point where I feel like that, that equation could, could change in, into a different direction. But as long as the, the new ones are so much better than the ones that were designed 15 years ago, and besides that, you have then a lot of, of challenges when it comes to safety, how, you, how you're checking, what is the state of health of those. Of course, of course there are all kinds of in, internal BMS systems that are supposed to tell you those, those, those uh, important data points, but how trustable are those again? So we have, we have done quite a bit of work there and we, we put it back in the drawer mm -hmm. for, for quite a while. All right, understand. Thank you for um, adding to that discussion. Um, now, the participants here are quite interested in the issue of cost. Uh, and you've mentioned it um, in your presentations, but let's get um, a, a closer look. Uh, what's the cost per kilowatt, a kilowatt for sodium solid state energy is the precise question. But perhaps the panelists could um, expand even more on the cost um, issues associated with your technologies. Uwe, would you like to start? Yes, very much so. Um, purchase is one item of the cost of using and operating a battery and having the benefit out of it. Levelized cost of storage is really the key. Uh, purchase is one, maintenance cost, and then what you get out of the battery. Because you have a financial plan of maybe 15, 20 years, does the battery still deliver the power? Does it still do what you are planning to do? What is your business case? So these things that are calculated, and I think for stationary storage, for operation, this is very, very important and levelized cost of storage are coming down. They can be six, they can be 10, they can be 15 cents. So this, this is the key factor. Solid state batteries at the moment are still slightly higher because of the production process, but in the total usage, they will be much cheaper. Michael, yeah, please. Well, I stated in the presentation um, that we will reach, <coughs> sorry, um, costs of, uh, to less than 25 euros per kilowatt hour on a DC system level. Um, that is something uh, which is obviously a bit more long term than the first products off the line, obviously, but um, it still shows where the direction of this technology goes to. I mean, yes, I'm in line with the levelized cost of storage. Um, it has always something to do with the use case, but in our use case, the cycle life is super low, so the levelized cost of storage cannot be really compared to high-psych applications, such as, I 
think you two are envisioning with your companies. So we're talking about 50 cycles a year. Uh, that's why it's, I mean, competing in terms of levelized cost of storage, very hard to do. Um, but um, the capex here are a key factor to get them as low as possible, but also have the highest efficiency as possible. And mm -hmm. um, obviously we could build more efficient batteries, but at higher cost. Um, and this is kind of a sweet spot we're targeting. Um, and uh, sometimes in that business case, we're uh, talking with uh, potential partners with, cost isn't really the matter because it gives a functionality that was not there before. So you cannot compare it against um, well, competing technologies, etc. cetera. But um, that's, that's my two cents on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Manuel, what's your perspective on this issue? Yeah, when it, when it comes to cost, I mean, I'm very, very much in my, my tunnel for lithium ion batteries at, at, at this moment. So when you look at the stationary storage system, um, and, and I'm, I'm looking very much at large installations, so utility scale installations, 50 megawatt hours, 100 megawatt hours. And if I remove all the balance of plant, which, which are then transformers, switch gears, cables, and so on, and really look at the battery storage system, in our case, the integrated inverter, and uh, let's say I put the two-hour system down, uh, then the, the battery cell will, will be part of like 50% of, of the bomb. Uh, and then it depends a bit what, what is then the actual system, system size, but we are talking then about uh, for, the, for the battery cells it, itself, uh, about the famous around 100 uh, euro per kilowatt hour, and then you have everything else on, on top of that. What we see also very often, because the technology is one part, but typically for those uh, stationary storage projects, you also have then besides a supply contract, a uh, so-called LTSA, uh, a long-term service agreement, mm -hmm. which comes then typically with the energy capacity guarantee. So you have a lookup table after which year do you have which guaranteed capacity. You have servicing, uh, you have uh, performance guarantees, for example, saying the system is available for 98% of the time. Uh, and so on and, and so forth. And very often, this part, which is then just a, an OPEX, if it's not paid up front, can be a significant part of, of like a project cost uh, itself. And we, we see that many suppliers are actually trying to push over a lot of cost into that part to have a very, very low supply product initially, which is from a business case perspective also nice because what I pay today is more expensive than what I pay in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's something to, to look out for. But yeah, I, I drifted a bit away from that question. Well, no, very interesting. But um, let's stick with the cost situation and perhaps also international competitiveness. Um, it's a big topic all throughout the conference. And I'm wondering uh, what you guys think about, you know, the, the, the possibilities or the opportunities for success for the Western developers vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese competition uh, and the Chinese business model in this, in this space. Um, how, can, how can the Western type uh, manufacturers compete? How can the developers compete? And how can they even live up to like economies of scale advantages that, West, uh, that Chinese manufacturers have? What, 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 do you, what do you think of that? I don't know, maybe I start. I mean, I, what do you mean I don't know? I'm very sure we, uh, we can compete. I mean, let's take the example CATL, the first gigafactory in, in Arnstadt. Every machinery, every system in there comes from Europe. The equipment, the machine, the robots, everything comes. The automation is done by uh, Fraunhofer itself, mm -hmm. Industry 4.0. They have a, a, a Sematec inside. Um, we can do the same. We just, uh, we have the knowledge, we have the, we have the people. Um, I think this morning it was well done, uh, said by Northwold and everything. We do everything the first time. We will make some mistakes, we will move fast. Uh, I see no reason why we cannot catch up if we all work together. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very optimistic outlook, fantastic. Um, Michael? I don't see it as, as a problem of uh, production <clears throat> because, I mean, all of our batteries, I think, can be produced on a large scale, very industrialized, very automated. And one thing that Germany or Europe is very good at is automization, industrialization. I think the key to being competitive in the global market is actually a supply chain that is low cost enough to compete with the Chinese or whatever manufacturers here in the world. And that is something um, why we set out to develop the iron salt battery chemistry because we can source everything 
at low cost already here in Europe and don't have to go into um, China, don't have to go to South America, don't have to go to Africa to source materials. And I think that is one of the, the key factors. Even if you build like a North Wall gigafactory whatsoever, you still have to source a few of those components from somewhere else. And I think this sourcing, that supply chain thing issue, however you want to see it, is the challenge of getting the cost down. Um, because in the end, um, the, the manufacturing of battery cells is, what, 20% of the, the cost in total. The majority is materials. Mm -hmm. And I can speak for ourselves. Our material cost is very low because iron, salt, and water is not expensive. Mm -hmm. it's more the for us, it's more the manufacturing uh, of things that is a challenge and needs to be worked on in order to get it to economies of scale. All right. Economies of scale, not th using that buzzword as well, it seems to be very important across the S different technologies. S scale scale is, a, is a big problem, mm -hmm. um, or not a problem, it's a challenge. Yeah. When we look at cattle or um, the big other players like mm -hmm. Samsung, LG, Panasonic, you name it, they already operate, or BYD, sorry to forget that, they already operate gigafactories like we cannot imagine. And they are already at, at levels of automation, of supply chain and costs that it's very hard to catch up for us here in Europe. Mm -hmm. Manuel, your take on this issue of cost and competitiveness with the Asian uh, um, developers and manufacturers? Yeah, I, I, I start with what, what Michael was just saying, scale is of, of the most importance to, to bring, bring down the cost. That's also one, one uh, of the reasons why we, when we developed our product, it said, okay, we need to move towards the utility scale to ramp up the volumes as fast as possible to bring down the, the cost mm -hmm. as fast as possible. Um, besides that, we also have an, a, two, two additional things. The one would be um, we have the approach of that vertical integration to understand the product really from, from bottom to top, mm -hmm. which gives you a significant uh, advantage. And the, the second thing is, I mean, we, we work with a lot of those Chinese uh, cell suppliers. So mm -hmm. we, we really cooperate with them and, and uh, going a couple of steps fur further uh, with, with kind of partnerships to, to really also learn from them because uh, at least at the moment, we, when we use those LFP cells, the, the best ones, fantastic quality, fantastic prices are, are coming out of China. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want to be competitive in that market, you need to work with, with those companies. Mm -hmm. But again, we, our approach is to understand the product that well that we are also able to switch there uh, in a relatively fast way by having that knowledge and have it considered that in the, in the product design mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much. I, I think uh, that got uh, to some more um, depth uh, concerning the um, competitiveness discussion. Um, there's another question. Uh, all of them are brilliant. Uh, thank you to, to the participants. That I think is really provocative, um, and I'd like to pose it to all three of you. Uh, and that is, it's kind of fundamental uh, in a way. Um, what is the advantage of batteries over hydrogen for the stationary storage? Uh, so that's getting, I mean, in, in the sense of a competitiveness analysis, that's really getting uh, to the core of uh, maybe there's an alternative that can um, uh, outdo and replace the, the whole battery um, uh, objective. So what do you think of that? Well, I think the answer is very easy. It's politically wanted and it may be necessary, but is it economically? No. Uh, when you produce hydrogen, you lose 70%. Right? You want to make a kilowatt hour, you will lose, you need four times the money to put in to get one euro out. And that is not sustainable. And there is no process on the electrolysis inside which will reduce these costs. Mm. So yes, we will have hydrogen for chemical processes, maybe steel, mm. maybe others for direct usage, and it makes sense for long-term storage. I mean, if you throw away wind energy you might as well just produce hydrogen, but does it really make sense? No. So batteries are so much more competitive. It, 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 there is no comparison. There will be no hydrogen cars, I assure you. There will be no fuel cells. 
because it just doesn't make any sense. You will have trucks that will have everything. But there will be hydrogen for direct reduction that is very CO2 efficient and may be payable in the future. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I don't really see it. Hmm. Well, I, s I second uh, uh, a lot of your opinions here because, um, as you said, hydrogen, hydrogen is too expensive. It is not just too expensive in terms of capex still. Uh, we see a lot of numbers coming out from various studies, et cetera, um, kind of predicting prices uh, going down by 90% in the next couple of years, which, well, it's very hard to achieve. Then we have to use rare earth materials uh, a lot for these. So that is questionable. On the other hand, efficiency, huge problem. 25% return trip efficiency. I'd say it's more like 30, 35%, but still you lose 60, 65%. 70 maybe, um, to heat or waste materials that you can really use. But where I, where I don't resonate with you is that if we have energy produced by wind power, which is not being used, we should throw it away because it doesn't make sense. I'd say we should, we should harvest that mm. and put it towards hydrogen. But it won't make nearly as much as um, um, in terms of capacity of the total storage capacity with other technologies as envisioned, wished by the government or political um, leaders. Um, and I do think that uh, hydrogen has some very good use cases. To be honest, aviation and shipping industry is, I think, the only way out is hydrogen. But um, it won't be in any car. Right. Maybe some trucks or uh, building equipment, but that's uh, another story. Um, but I don't see it as a very large scale uh, storage solution as well, and the production of hydrogen somewhere else and shipping it to Germany. I mean, nobody have, has ever, I think, calculated the, the amount of energy required to ship hydrogen from one place to another um, because it's so less dense. It requires so much tanks and stuff around. It doesn't make sense at any level, but um, that's also my opinion. Mm. Maybe Manuel has something mm -hmm. else. Maybe but if I can just yeah, sure. add for the, for the audience, do your mind joking when we're saying Let's say, yes, wind energy is also not free. Let's say we have a very large turbine, five, 10 megawatt hours. Maybe you can achieve 15 cents per kilowatt hour in operating cost. Now, when you produce hydrogen, you take this times four, is 60 cents, and then you put it back into the system and generate power, which you use another one. So that means a kilowatt hour will cost you 80 cents per kilowatt hour plus. That, that, that is a minimum. So who, who can use this? I mean, steel plants can't do yeah, anything. Yeah, but, but if you're in an edge case, there's no electricity in the grid. We have to buy it from the Swiss because they have large legs storing it in, um, yeah. selling it us to more than a euro per yeah. kilowatt I mean, hour. That I agree. Makes sense. That so I agree, and that will happen because we have a gas pipeline system in Europe, okay. and that will be partly filled with hydrogen for political and geopolitical security. But that is another story. So heat is another story because the efficiency of hydrogen and heat is much, much higher than uh, putting back to electricity. Very interesting. Um, Manuel, uh, will we be seeing hydrogen-powered products from your company anytime soon? No. <laughs> no. That is, not, that is not in the plan. Um, I mean, on the mobility side of things, I just uh, agree there. It doesn't make too much sense. Uh, the, the transportation of it itself uh, seems to be crazy difficult. I personally worry quite a bit that there is a massive lobby behind that that tries to push in um, just yeah, gray black hydrogen, so not the one that, that is actually produced by, by a wind and a solar farm, which is uh, until today basically nothing, but actually the, the methane that is then cracked down into, mm -hmm. into hydrogen and that uh, keeps then a lot of oil and gas companies running their, their normal business model. The, what, what I heard here before about um, uh, to, to convert it to, to have this excess energy and to convert it potentially into uh, hydrogen or to store it somewhere. Um, I have there an opinion that is probably controversial to all of our three business cases, which is as much as possible not to store, but to, to use it. And especially uh, in Germany, we are really uh, like blocked there, for example, by not having smart meters installed that doesn't allow you to have any kind of uh, flexible energy tariffs because then you, the end customer would have an incentive to, to really use it when, when the most of that energy is produced because then the prices are the lowest. This is where you have then at home any kind of like smart meter device that turns on the heat pump or whatever you have installed. 
And there I see uh, uh, actually a massive uh, potential that, that is, at least here in Germany, not used. And it's to me completely cuckoo why, why we're so behind on that one. I mean, I, I, would, I would use the excess um, electricity from windmills or solar whenever it's not needed to actually convert it to hydrogen, but then use it in other processes, not com uh, converting it back into electricity for the grid mm -hmm. and using it as electricity. Mm -hmm. Again, aviation industry, um, shipping industry, mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's the only way forward to decarbonize those sectors. And the hydrogen has to come from somewhere, and it's good if that's energy that's already there being wasted, mm -hmm. used for this part. Won't be nearly as enough, but um, let, let's be honest, it's, I mean, we, we made great strides in, in developing hydrogen fuel cells, but um, we know we're near where we need to be in order to get it to economical levels, apart from, let's say, aviation. Mm -hmm. But for, for the normal transportation sector, et cetera, we just heard the presentation of Stordot, 350 watt hours per kilogram, 10 minute charge time, I mean, uh, you, you cannot ev even achieve that with a uh, hydrogen mm -hmm. total system weight per um, capacity, cost, mm -hmm. levels, efficiency, etc. So, All right. Well, um, I would say perhaps not that big a surprise. We have three battery experts up here who are very critical about hydrogen. But anyway, I think the point is well taken uh, that uh, it has its niche. Uh, from your perspective at least, um, when it comes to uh, using waste energy uh, and also perhaps in some mobility aspects as well, uh, as you mentioned in, uh, in, um, in aviation or shipping, for example. So there's some potential there. Um, that's the outcome concerning this question. And uh, we only unfortunately have uh, two minutes left, but um, I'd like to tie a few of the many questions together. Uh, one of them is um, the latest trends in terms of chemistry. Um, in the battery field, and also um, what are um, your thoughts on energy density? There's several questions on energy density. Maybe we can combine this with a discussion of trends in, in, in chemistry. Um, who would like to start with this field before we have to end? Then I'd like to start. Sure. Um, for the trends in terms of chemistry, I'm open to any, any chemistry um, or for any storage solution or battery that helps us advance in the goal of having renewable energies in the grid. So that's simple. And there will be a lot of different technologies for different applications. Long duration energy storage, more like short duration energy storage, or also short duration energy storage. Um, and we need both, or like all of them. Um, form factor. Um, a huge thing a couple of years ago was decentralized storage in the sense of every household should have its own battery. Yeah. Um, this is something very Germanish, uh, it, but it doesn't work anywhere else in the world. So um, the rest of the world is actually converging to bigger systems, to large installations in several hundreds of megawatt hours or even gigawatt hours in terms of size. And I think that will be the future due to just the cost reduction because a huge part of the system cost is inverter cost is the balance of plant mm -hmm. and that goes down per kilowatt hour um, when you go bigger. Mm -hmm. And for the gravimetric and volumetric energy density, it says here for volt storage, so I'm gonna, gonna answer that right away. <laughs> it's roughly uh, on the electrolyte side 30 watt hours per kilogram um, or 30 watt hours per liter ish, 25 watt hours per liter ish. So um, that is something uh, we can do better, but to be honest, it sits around for 20 years, sitting there. Um, as, as long as we can build the same amount of capacity mm -hmm. per square meter of space on the ground, uh, then lithium-ion batteries, I think we're... Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, Manuel, um, wh what about the trends? What's your perspective on the new trends in chemistry? Um, I mean, what we are looking at is today, large prismatic 280 amp hour LFP cells. We will have a, a couple of really cool um, iterations there. I mentioned earlier we will see pre-lithiated cells, which extend then the lifetime of, of those LFP chemistries uh, a little further, and that will make sure that, especially in the in the early years, the degradation degradation of the of those cells is very very limited. Mm -hmm. um, in a in in a couple of years, then three four years, we we expect to see sodium ion also in, in stationary storage applications, mm -hmm. and. Those would be for the, uh, the two, two, maybe up to eight hour uh, storage applications. For longer durations, I'm looking to my colleague to the, to the right because I think uh, for the lithium ion or, or then sodium ion, it might be 
uh, where, where we're reaching this, this tipping edge. But yeah, who, who knows where really the, 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 the number will be where, where this application makes more sense. Yeah, that remains open. That remains open. Uh, Uwe, you have the chance for the famous last sentence. Well, I'm happy <laughs> about that. Uh, keep me in mind. I'll be here next year. No. Um, LFP will be the, the choice of battery because it's driven by availability. And, and this is now in fabrication and coming out. After that, it will be sodium ion. After that, sodium chloride, sodium chloride solid state, and then solid state batteries. So that will be the, the digression, what happens. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, many successful companies. And Excellent. We'll see you. Thank you, you can judge us next year. Thank you very much also for the lookout to next year. Thanks to the three experts for the presentations and the great discussion. And thanks you, thank you to all of you in the audience for the great questions.